Are you faced with landscaping that you don't like but you can't change? Because it's very expensive to change landscaping. And if you're in a rented house or flat, then actually you may not be allowed to change it anyway. So I've come to a flat in central London to speak to garden designer Sean Mooney, who has completely transformed his very small backyard entirely with pots and containers. And he's created a real perennial garden here. It's Alexandra here from the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel and blog. And I'll leave links to Sean Mooney's website and to other resources we mention in the description below. If you're new here, the Middle Sized Garden uploads weekly with tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden. So if you'd like to see the videos when you open up YouTube, tap subscribe. So Sean, what were you faced with when you first moved in here? So when we first moved in, there was just pure patio and the shed which you can see behind me and nothing else to speak of. There wasn't a single plant at all. And you did also have, and I think I have to mention this, is you've got artificial grass here, which isn't what you would have chosen. No, I think it looks absolutely ghastly, but again, not my choice, couldn't do anything about that. And it is one of the first things that people say when they come round is they don't expect a garden designer to have AstroTurf, but it does come with the nature of renting. So well, I think once people get over that initial shock, they're more obsessed with the planting and would rather have a look at that instead. So is everything in pots? Everything is in pots and containers, absolutely everything. And what I've tried to create is perennial beds. And originally I wanted to have a front and a back of a border, which is really difficult to achieve in such a narrow footprint. So instead what I've done is have um, high containers and um, slightly shorter pots in the front to create that kind of front, middle and back effect. And how did you plan the planting in the pots? I've chosen plants which are happy in a moist but um, well-drained or, or free-draining soil in full sun. So lots of Mediterranean plants or perennials which are happy in full sun. I've taken quite a lot of inspiration from my course at Capel Manor College in Garden Design where we look quite a lot at uh, Mediterranean planting and drought tolerant planting. And in terms of the pots themselves, I mean actually collecting this many pots is quite expensive so how did you manage that? So a lot of the pots, particularly the bubble glazed um, weatherproof pots, they are quite expensive. So where I've got those at the front of a border or they stand alone, I've invested the money in the more showy, quite pretty pots. In my little herb collection down here in the corner, I've just got bog standard terracotta pots from the DIY shop uh, down the road because you know, at the end of the day, you often don't see them. Something which I quite love doing is my other half is Spanish. And in his particular part of Spain, in Galicia, they're famous for crisps. I think they're the best crisps in the world. And the hardy herbs like chives and oregano, quite happy in these tins. You drill some holes in the bottom and they look lovely together as a group and have that little taste of the Mediterranean here in South London. Lovely. And you've also got some deeper troughs, so where do you get those from? I had them made bespoke from um, a chap on eBay and I showed him the plans for the garden and he actually recommended some sizes and some um, different shapes he could make. I've got an L-shaped planter in here. Um, the planter behind me actually has different tiers to it so that we've got um, a Calamagrostis Carl Forster in the back um, with some asters in the front. So there's um, a nice undulation in height and it actually allows us to have a screen on the first part of the garden with the opening into lawn in the middle so that there's a little bit of a reveal as you turn corners and you can't see all the way through the garden. And that's of course quite an important thing in garden design, isn't it? Not to just put things round the edges and you need to have a bit more shape in them. So how did you plan the shape of the garden? The shape? largely was already prescribed by the hard landscaping that our landlord had put in. There's a patio immediately here at the back of the house and a lawn here behind a lawn, AstroTurf. And what we've tried to do is capitalise on having a really nice patio here with planting all around, get a little bit of privacy and that little bit of closure. But really what I've tried to do is fill in all of the corners and rather than having little skinny beds around the back and not just have one layer of planting and try and have you know, a long trough and then some pots in front of it so that really you can't tell that it's one rectangle with a longer rectangle at all here because everything's all nice and soft around the edges and your eye doesn't really follow any straight lines around the perimeter at all. Was the shed here? The shed was already here. Um, we're quite grateful for it because we both cycle, so it's somewhere nice and convenient to stow the bikes. 
We did customise it with a little horseshoe, which is quite typical in sort of, you know, working class London families that work outside quite a lot. And uh, we haven't had any accidents yet, so hopefully the horseshoe is the thing keeping us safe. Yes, yeah, so this is a British belief, isn't it? That yes. if you put a horseshoe over your door, you won't have accidents. Yes, it has to be this way up, so it becomes a container for good luck. If your horseshoe ever swings upside down, you need to replace it immediately and get a new one because it's done its job, it's burnt out. Oh, right. You can't just turn it the right way up again. No, that's it. I have to get a new one. <laughs> and there's also a pallet sofa that you've done. Is what, How did you manage that? Obviously, when you buy new plants for the garden, there's a snowballing cost to be considered that not only do you need the plants themselves, the containers, but also compost. And we needed a lot of transported soil because we don't have any access to the ground whatsoever. So we bought all of our compost in bulk and it came in these massive skip bags on pallets. So we obviously had quite a few of them left over and we were umming and ahhing over what to make. And at that end of the garden, we didn't initially have anywhere to sit and catch the afternoon sun. So it made sense for us to reutilize those pallets and make a pallet planter. And I've planted alpines in the back as well, which I hardly even have to water. They're quite small. They don't really tickle the back of your neck, but it's somewhere else for more plants to go. So did you have any failures with trying to grow certain plants in pots or can you pretty much grow any plant you like in pots? I think that you can grow more or less any plant in a pot. There is obviously an uphill struggle that comes with growing certain species in pots. As I mentioned, I'm managing to grow successfully a Himalayan silver birch, which does require quite a lot of water. However, we also got a prunus avium, a wild cherry, through the Trees for Londoners uh, campaign from the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, which is not doing very well. Um, and even though we water it the same, I think that ultimately it can't get its roots out and it's just miserable. So I think you do have to choose quite carefully about what you grow in pots, which is why it's always helpful to have a chat with a garden designer before you commit any budget to plants. And indeed nurseries as well, if you're buying from a nursery where they grow plants themselves, yes, then they would be quite a good source, would, would you say? Yes, absolutely. And I think speaking with nursery people and growers, they just want to share so much. And I think one of the fantastic things about switching from a decade in marketing to horticulture, it's a genuine community of people. People just want to share knowledge and share resources so much. And I have learned an incredible amount from nurseries over the past year and a half about what works well in containers and what doesn't. So you were a career changer and you went from marketing to gardening and then to garden design. Yes. But what would you recommend to anyone thinking of making that jump? Just do it. Like, I think we've all learned over the past couple of years in particular that life can be short, too short to be spent miserable, I think. Yeah, it is actually just humming with pollinators, this garden. Yes. As everywhere I look, there is a busy bee yeah. sorting out something for its supper. <laughs> You've even managed to incorporate a pond in this fairly small area. So tell us about how you did that. So I don't think it's very difficult to encourage wildlife into your garden at all. If you, you know, plant some perennials, you've got forage immediately for bees and butterflies. Um, but something that is particularly important is attracting other kinds of wildlife like dragonflies. And we're particularly lucky to have the River Ravensbourne just a couple of streets away. And since we got the pond, we get dragonflies. We see the bees and wasps having little drink in the shallow beaches. And we've even had um, tadpoles and froglets as well. So it's really nice to have a thrumming, you know, buzzing garden. When you come out, you get to enjoy the beauty of it. But it's also comforting to know that particularly in a time of so much upheaval in biodiversity, at least our small city garden has um, something to offer wildlife. And also tell me about the wormery. So we don't have a traditional compost bin like a Dalek um, compost bin uh, because we don't have anywhere on the floor where a compost bin could go over and we would have contact with the soil. So the wormery um, is really important because we don't have a traditional Dalek compost bin um, and it allows us to process all of our food waste. The only thing that we put in landfill are the alliums, onion and garlic and chilli and things that you know worms really don't like because it acidifies the compost too much. They take absolutely all of our food scraps, our tea bags, potato peelings, um, even cut flowers that we would take from the garden. So everything gets composted and we can reuse it again. Obviously the same with any compost system, we don't put any meat or fish or particularly fatty substances like um, the oil from your frying pan in either. We open the trapdoor, put in um, vegetable food scraps, shut the lid, 
they compost everything down, but then they actually swim through the soil, through the holes in the side, fertilize the root systems of our veg patch in a container, and we get bountiful harvests of all kinds of vegetables in such a small space, and all of our food scraps from our food bin are taken care of. How often do you have to change the compost in the pots, and are you having to buy a whole load of new compost twice a year in order to make sure that the plants stay healthy? I tend not to repot in the same pot and change the compost. What they do do in autumn and spring is just add an extra inch on top of a store-bought compost. But I'm also adding the worm compost from the worm composting bins as a mulch on top. And it's particularly dense in not only nutrients, so your sort of essential nitrogen, potassium, um, but also bacteria from the guts of the worms. And that actually helps build a healthy ecosystem within the soil that the plants can take energy from and you know as you can see everything flowers quite wonderfully in here and I don't use any artificial fertilizers at all. You feed your pots on a once a week basis what what do you use for that? So I use a diluted worm tea that comes from the wormery with a tap and all I do is I open the lid I pour the hose in for about a minute until I can hear the water running out the bottom and I dilute it at about a 1 to 10 ratio in my 10 litre watering can and just give all of the pots a really good healthy drink. Oh, and what about watering? Can you tell me how you manage watering so many pots? I have to water pretty much every day at this time of year. I might get off, you know, with about a couple of times a week, but I am watering a lot, particularly in the summer, and it does take me about an hour <laughs> to do the front and the back. But it's really important to do a nice long drink until you can see the water running out the bottom of the pot. Don't be stingy on watering things in pots. You, it's very difficult to overwater something in a pot because the water should drain through. In terms of plants that do well in pots for a perennial border, are there some special favourites you can recommend? Yes, um, I particularly love Verbena bonariensis for giving that kind of height and that airiness. Um, it goes really well with grasses like Miscanthus sinensis morning light. And I really love um, Salvia nemorosa caradonna because it just flowers so abundantly. But I do think my particular favourite is the Agastaches, Agastache blackadder. I think there's bees buzzing right behind my head as we speak. Oh, um, and it's an absolute magnet for bees. You can deadhead it and keep it flowering all the way to October. Yes, yes, it's almost quite distracting having so many bees. <laughs> I do I keep, keep looking at it. It's them. a nice problem to have. Yes. And also Nicotiana, you've been saying you very much like. Yes. Um, the Nicotiana is a funny one because um, it's actually pollinated by moths, but the bumblebees have worked out how to get the nectar in the Nicotiana by biting the bottom of the flower stem because they can't get the proboscis inside the flower itself and they drink the sapta from the base instead. So sometimes I just sit for a minute and watch the cheeky bumblebees help themselves. And here you've got the how are you doing the planting in the pond? So in here we've got some Typha minima, um, which like the great bulrush, and this is the mini bulrush, but it's still quite good for attracting uh, dragonflies. And I don't know if you can just see down there, there's a ho hoverfly or a wasp, just having a drink of the water from the very shallow uh, water level in the little beach yeah. that I've got in there. And often you'll see pollinators just having a little drink yeah. in a, on a summer's afternoon in the pond. That's lovely. I heard a frog. There is a frog in there. I did hear a frog. Yes. It was definitely a frog. Yes, yeah, that's great. Amazing. I was wondering if they actually had survived, so that's good yeah. to know that uh, they're croaking for <laughs> <Yes>. your visit. <laughs> I'll put a link to a playlist on pots and containers with lots of really useful ideas at the end of this video. And let me know what you think. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.